Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. I've known Bill Van and Hoovel since Robert Kennedy days in New York. Now, after his many years of extraordinary public service, he's written a wonderful book that shares insights and highlights of those times. The book is titled Hope and History, a mem memoir of tumultuous times, and he's my guest today. It is truly a great book. I couldn't really put it down. I'm so happy to hear that, Ronnie. <laughs> I was born on January 30th, Franklin Roosevelt's oh, well, yeah, birthday. Absolutely. At the beginning of his career as president. A holiday in our family. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and in my family, too. It's a birthday party. And so I had this total immediate connection. And it lasted with me throughout my lifetime. And he so inspired me. <laughs> Franklin as well. Frank, his tenure, and then later Eleanor, but I'll tell you about that later. But you write about it so well. Okay. I feel it so deeply. Yeah. I mean, to me, uh, Roosevelt was the president who came in and led a democratic revolution. Right. Took a country that was teetering on the brink of true disaster, unemployment 25%. Uh, at farm foreclosures, home foreclosures. And as a boy in Rochester, New York, I sensed all that and grew up with all right. of that as background. So uh, I share uh, that sense of, uh, of Roosevelt's greatness and Eleanor, too. Okay. He was so forceful and so eloquent yes. that we listened to him on the radio and you just knew. And those four things uh, for freedoms mm. are what's really guided me, I've decided, through my life. It was an interesting thing. thing. You see today war everywhere, but you don't see anybody talking peace. World War II began, and we were not even in it when he gave the Four Freedoms mm -hmm. speech. But he said that that war is going to take so much, so many of our children, it's going to take so much of our resources, etc., that we've can only justify it to history by having a, a society and a social structure that follows it that prevents it from happening again. And that's the four freedoms and freedom from the fear, religion, freedom from expression, freedom and religion. of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear. I mean, those are, those are the directions you'd like to see the world go in. It's not happening right now. Especially that freedom from fear and freedom yeah. from want. Yes. I mean, that, and, and his government, I mean, we agree with his interpretation of government. It's to really to assist people. That's right. Government is what he said. And in 1937, inaugurally, he said, don't judge me by how much I've done to add to those who have much. Judge me by how much I've done to help those who have need. Yeah. And that's a good measure for government. I think he had the authority and the eloquence that Winston Churchill had, but we seem to hear more about Winston Churchill than we do about Franklin. I, I just don't understand why. Well, his career was eclipsed. I mean, he, mm -hmm. you know, people don't un remember that in Great Britain, the last election they had before the war was in 1935, mm -hmm. and they didn't have another one until 1945. Oh, oh that's right. But so when they had it, they threw Winston Churchill out of office dramatically and drastically. <laughs> Whereas Roosevelt led the country in four presidential mm -hmm. victories, mm -hmm. seven congressional victories. I mean, he was a great politician, as well as being a leader in so many other ways. It's, it's interesting, at Hyde Park now, there's an exhibit that has just opened on Roosevelt and Churchill. And okay. it's very good. Okay. It, it's in conjunction with uh, uh, D-Day, mm. which is June 6th. Mm. This is the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Mm -hmm. But uh, Roosevelt and Churchill had an extraordinary relationship. But I don't think there's any doubt among historians now that Roosevelt was by far the overwhelming leader of, of the forces of a new world. Arthur Schlesinger used to say, this is Roosevelt's world. Churchill was an imperialist. He would have happily gone back to the 19th century. <laughs> oh, great. That's you right. Know, it was not Hitler's world or Stalin's world, the dictators. It's Roosevelt's world and commitment to a liberal, decent government. Would he be called a socialist today? No, because he's not advocating nationalism. 
national, nationalizing. Socialism in our day was Norman Thomas. Right. Norman Thomas that was, was another great man. <laughs> He's a great figure, but and he was he and people like Theodore Roosevelt advocated policies and programs like Social Security and minimum wage, etc. But they never could get it through Congress. It was Roosevelt who did that. So is Bernie Sanders a real socialist? Well, he's registered as a socialist, I know. not as a Democrat. Right. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Because I yes, think it's always so the funny. The most that... important re revolution in our times came through the Democratic Party. Yeah. And I think it, this is an extraneous issue that the Republicans, and especially Trump, are just going to right. whip day after day. Right. So the book is not only about Roosevelt. I mean, it, you go on, it's about heroes in your life, and it's really a memoir because it fills in in between. And it's just been a very much ex the most exciting life that I almost can think of. <laughs> so, but you started out in Rochester as a kid, poor, basically, lower middle income. My mother ran a boarding house. Right. And landed up at this wonderful school in the desert in California, and then at college in another wonderful place, and then law school, right? And then what happened? That was the, f well, you, well, let's talk uh, about Baldwin. Yes, one of the chapters in the book is about mentors. Mm -hmm. And I choose two who were important in my life. And I was asked when I was in Virginia some years ago, the, the 100th anniversary of the First World War. <clears throat> I was visiting the college and somebody asked me if I would give a lecture on the First World War. Well, I thought for a moment, I said, this is a perfect opportunity for me to talk about Roger Baldwin and Bill Donovan, Wild Bill Donovan. Donovan, the greatest military hero of the country's history and the most decorated soldier of World War I. Roger Baldwin pr went to prison, refused to go to the Army, conscientious objector. Donovan came out of all of that as creating the OSS and the CIA and it was a confidant of Roosevelt. Roger Baldwin came out of it and formed the American Civil Liberties Union, probably the most important right. non-governmental group in the country. And so there, it was wonderful having the juxtaposition of the two of them, such deep influences in my life. Donovan was a lawyer. One, uh, somebody said to me the other, well, how did you meet him? Well, it was, I was, had enlisted in the Air Force because of the war, the Korean War. But during the interim period, I worked at General Donovan's law firm. He didn't know who I was, but I was working one night late in the library, and General Donovan came up. He said, young man, can you help me here with some research? I'm debating Estes Kefauver for tomorrow <laughs> as to whether the Democratic Party has been good for the country in the last 20 years. <laughs> And then with the temerity of a 22-year-old, I said to him, well, General, I'm a Democrat, <laughs> and I'm a Rooseveltian. I said, well, but I think the best way for me to help you is to tell you what Estes Kefauver is going to say, and we can build an answer to that. Well, we worked into the night, and I went with him the next day and stayed with him the rest of his life. Where did you go? Thailand. He was very close to General Eisenhower. Yeah. And Eisenhower wanted him to go to France. He didn't want to go to France because that was the post that was really run from Washington. Eisenhower was the president. Yeah, Eisenhower was president. So Eisenhower said, well, nobody knows anything about Southeast Asia. And that's where there's a lot of trouble. Would you go out in Thailand? Your very presence would say to the communist world, we'll fight if you get this far. And then, so I was in Vietnam. In 1953, And 54. you could see what was going to happen. Oh, yeah. I felt it deeply, too. Yeah. And in the book, I have excerpts from my diary that I wrote during mm -hmm. those days when Dien, Dien Bien Phu fell in 1954. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just felt so badly that America knew so little that, that, we were, that yeah. they would think that restoring France to power in Vietnam or in Southeast Asia was progress. And it was a disaster, of course. And then after the French got beaten, vaguely and mm. slowly, we took it over again. But Donovan was a very unusual, wonderful man. I lived with him when he was ambassador in Thailand. We traveled the world. He always took me with him. And uh, I learned a great deal. Mm. And then 
His last great public service was the Hungarian Revolution. And he was then chairman of the International Rescue Committee. And that was in 56, 1956. So we went to Hungary. I was there for two months helping to organize the refugee and all of that. It's where I met John Lindsay. Oh, really? <laughs> and, and it became a lifelong... Yeah, I'm still on the board of the International right. <laughs> 64 years yeah. later, I'm still on the board. After Donovan, I went to uh, 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 the Justice Department. Yeah, that's one. Donovan died in 59. Kennedy was elected in 60. Mm -hmm. And I became Robert Kennedy's mm -hmm. assistant, whom you knew so well. He loved you. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Kennedy really thought you were the smartest and best politician he met in New York. That's Far what none. to hear. <laughs> uh, I'm beginning to think as I get finally older that maybe I was. <laughs> nobody I mean, would think of you as getting older. <laughs> we could still whip these kids, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know we could. We really could. <laughs> anyway, but that thrust you into civil rights. That's right. The big issue that was an incredible Robert Kennedy has been to deal with was Prince Edward County. And that was a situation in the state of Virginia where the Virginians had organized massive resistance to Brown against Board of Education and school desegregation. And they took the position that the Supreme Court can tell us to desegregate, but it cannot tell us to have public schools and we're gonna close them. And that's what they did. So in Prince Edward County for five mm. years, we had no public schools. President Kennedy was appalled by the situation. The courts were just dragging their feet in the South. So Bobby sent me a, to study the situation and recommend a course of action. I recommended we set up our own school system. That's what we did. It was a remarkable thing. It helped these children come into contact with modern education. It was very successful. And it was, uh, I, I think, when we finally opened the schools again, it made up to the children in large part what they had lost. But it, I learned an enormous amount in all of these things. I mean, the heroes of the South were the African American Such leaders. Such brave, oh, so committed brave. people, yeah. Threatened constantly, children with anxieties others wouldn't have. So I think of Reverend Francis Griffin, who was the head of the local Baptist church and the head of the state NAACP, he was constantly being threatened. It's changed considerably. That, that was the best of all. It was amazing that we've lived through that. When I went to college, I went to Barnard and we had an annual trip to Washington. And one of our friends, an African-American beautiful young woman, one decided to go with us. And then it turned out the hotel was segregated. The Y, we all said we'd stay at the Y, that was segregated. In my lifetime and in your lifetime, we've seen. Absolutely. It's... Now the South was, and, it, and what's happened since then, you know, what's happened mostly is mm -hmm. that white leadership has abandoned public education. Mm -hmm. And we made tremendous progress in Brown against Board of You know, I often wonder when people talk about the Supreme Court, what would have happened if if Earl Warden was a chief judge of the court and convinced eight other judges that they had to end segregation mm -hmm. in America. The South wouldn't have ended it. Mm -hmm. Eighteen of the leading Southern Democrats sent a telegram to the president after the court decision saying what well, this was a disaster. They couldn't do, you know, they shouldn't have these rights. Anyway, that was an education I never got. Bobby was terrific yeah. in those. Yeah. I mean, he understood it, and he had to learn, too. Yeah. Well, that was what's so exciting about him, wasn't it? Yes. That he was continuing, continuous learning and changing, and, and so much of his heart was in so many things. I yes. mean, he just, he just had... He, he hated bullies. Yes. Uh, you know, he really, you, know, you right. saw that. Uh, right. People thought he was uh, sort of tough and ruthless. Oh, they said he was, was always ruthless, but I, I A lot of that was a, a gentleness about him, mm -hmm. a shyness about him. Exactly. That, that he had. And, uh, but when he got into an issue, he didn't let go. And, and black rights and civil rights. And then the president, you know, I look back at that Ronnie, and that 
year, several year period, we lost the president, assassination. We lost Bobby, assassination. We lost Martin Luther King, assassination. Three great leaders who any country would have been so proud of. And we lost them and... And, and, and the three may be the most magnetic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. who had a leadership quality mm -hmm. that would have taken the country in a different direction. People who saw the future. Yeah. Yeah, and understood it. And then, you know, all of it got weighed down by Vietnam. The war in Vietnam canceled out the brilliant things that Lyndon Johnson did. And much survives of his legislation. But his, his I, I can't wait for Bob Caro's final volume. <laughs> so I, I can find out authoritatively why Johnson did what he did. Yeah. yeah. Men of his political instincts. And yeah. Anyway. It's too bad. He really did some very great things. Yes, and he then did. He did. And then Another issue that you talk about in here is criminal justice. Oh, boy. <laughs> you if were... you get into criminal justice, you never leave. It's a, it's a subject that's so fraught with humanity it's, and challenge. It's all the problems we face, all isn't it? All the problems. Poverty, everything. Walk into a prison and you're, you're visiting your whole country. I, I, in the book, I, I give a lot of plaudits to John Lindsay. Mm -hmm. He appointed me chairman of the Board of Correction. We were not of the same party. We had mm -hmm. run against each other, all of that. He didn't, he didn't ask any questions. And I only said one. I said, we're not going to be able to do anything unless we work together. If you come to the point where you think that's a problem, just let me know and I will quietly drift into the evening air. But while we're there, we got to do it. And we did it. I, I try in the book. And Attica, of course, happened at the yeah. same time. With Rockefeller. Right. So the enormous public attention that was on the prisons um, made it possible. The greatest reform was to end the overcrowding. And when I became head of Board of Corrections, we had 25,000 prisoners in the city prisons. Today we have 9,000. That is the most important. And we're working to even less than that. Right. So, and if we can straighten out the bail laws, mm -hmm. we can do much more than that. Prisons aren't a place where you can rehabilitate, especially city prisons. Mm -hmm. You can teach some basics, and we did. We installed uh, reading programs, literacy programs, public health programs, teach people how to live. You have, you know, in the prisons, you're dealing with a 5% of the population that's never had a chance. And so you really have to approach it differently than we do. I think the, the, I always felt that the prison was a community institution and should be designed to run the victim of the crime so that that person's rights are protected and that person's understood. So I feel, and I hope the book reflects, that we really did a great deal. Attica was just the opposite. You know, 43 people were killed. The greatest prison. And not by the prisoners. And not by the prisoners, which the governor tried to believe, announce when that first happened, that he had sent in the state guard and that the 43 had been killed by prisoners. Mm. But it was one solitary young doctor in Rochester, New York, who did the autopsies. Mm. And he announced that all of the people who had been killed had been killed by state police. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. It, it transformed the issue because people were ready to jump on it and say those prisoners got what they deserved. But I knew that wouldn't, prisoners don't do, behave that way in, a, in that kind of a circumstance. Yeah. Dostoevsky once wrote, um, you know, the prison is the expression of your society. Once you see it, you understand who you are. Well, for a long time, that wasn't a nice thing to know. So, but it was a very great learning experience for me. I've always felt that I go there and, you know, that I, by the grace of God, am not there. <laughs> I, I, you know, so many, it's just, maybe that's in a women's prison because the women are, you know. Well, you, you in Bedford particularly. Yeah, yeah. Let's go back now to Eleanor Roosevelt. 
<laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt. First time I met her, I was an eight-year-old boy in Rochester, and she came up to Rochester for I Am an American Day. <clears throat> and I said to my mother, and my parents did not speak good English, I said, you've got to meet Mrs. Roosevelt. This is so important. So we went to the Eastman School of Music, and there was a program, and Mrs. Roosevelt spoke. And I, my mother was concerned I was pushing too hard. I said, no, oh, come on up to the stage. <laughs> I'll introduce you to Mrs. Roosevelt. And of course, Mrs. Roosevelt was so gracious to everybody. But years later, when we all were together in the reform movement that mm. she led, and I mm -hmm. saw her in a number of other circumstances, she, was a re she made a remarkable contribution mm -hmm. to the conscience of the country. She did. And, and the president, people you know, aren't aware for the most part how disabled he was, but mm -hmm. he was a paraplegic. Yeah. So that she did the traveling mm -hmm. and she did the reporting and she had a very keen eye. She was great. I um, met her just, well, I think twice, but she started a program called Youth Builders and I was in junior high school, and I had the most wonderful civics teacher, and he had a chapter of Youth Builders. And oh, I owe a lot to him. I mean, he took my basic feelings that I had and really directed me into the more... I know, hope the message gets through in this book, but I feel so strongly about the debt we owe our teachers. I felt... Absolutely. In Rochester, they had a wonderful public school system. People worked hard. Teachers were really highly regarded at near the top of the social, social pole. And uh, Who suggested that you go to Desert Springs? My high school principal. He knew about it. And he... That's the, that's the uh, building, to, I mean, the, the college, two-year college. Yeah, that's a two-year college in, in the California. desert. <laughs> But it was it's a uh, ranch. It's, it's, it's a ranch, mm. and the students run everything. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was designed as an experiment for young men at that time. Now, for the first time, we have women too. But in the first 100 years of this school, it was men who isolated in the remote distances of California, Sierra Madre, uh, learn leadership, learn responsibility. Survival. <laughs> learned work and right. learned how to work too, and have the best intellectual challenge. Mm -hmm. It was certainly by far the most important mm -hmm. single experience Isn't in education. That interesting? For me. Yeah. So. yeah. Now about the UN, that comes back to Roosevelt and world federalists or the idea of an international organization that was going to maintain peace and did all wonderful things in the world. It's right, yeah. and someday we're going to get it. Yeah. I mean, the, the United Nations is the first organization that every country in the world is a member of. That's mm -hmm. an amazing achievement in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Roosevelt died too young. Uh, he lived long enough to create it. He lived long enough to force, force mm -hmm. the Russians and the British to be part of its permanent structure. Churchill, for example, dismissed the Chinese, saying they're too weak, they aren't going to... Roosevelt said, in 50 years, China's going to be one of the great countries of the world. Let's get them adopted now. I think the UN has to uh, be successful. I mean, well, it is successful in its mm -hmm. own currency. The member states have presented, prevented it from being truly successful. The UN and the Security Council should be the means by which war is stopped and prevented. The Syrian war is a disgrace to humanity. 600,000 people killed. And if you ask anybody that's involved with it, what was it about, they can't tell you. Yeah. So I, I'm a great believer that one of the most, that the greatest threat to American democracy is endless war. And we are in a cycle of endless war. We're looking for it all the time. All the time. It's I mean, and to have advisors like John Bolton at, at the president's side is, is just an invitation to catastrophe. We've got to, I'd, I'd like to try something different. I'd like to get the armed forces involved in preventing war instead of just fighting war. I think a lot of the best and brightest people in the country are in the armed forces. And they don't, they don't have a sufficient challenge, I don't think. 
our security is secure. We are the strongest country in the world. And we have every weapon times 10 that anybody else has. What we need to do is learn how to negotiate. I mean, we were doing pretty well. Yeah. With that uh, yeah. thing that President Obama yeah, negotiated did, with Iran. With the was different. There. Well, I hate to tell you this, but we've come to the end of this program. So what? You're, th you're gonna have to come back <laughs> again, because we haven't talked about Carter. We right. haven't talked oh. about being ambassador to the United States, right? <laughs> right. And we haven't gotten at much of your advice and hope for the future. I would be delighted to come back, Ronnie. Thank Even you. Even if there's no microphone, you and I can come yeah, back. Yeah, we could go on forever. <laughs> it's so much fun. And the other thing is that you'll be able to explain also some of the positions of the of Roosevelt, and I'd yes. to do that. So yeah. thank you, my dear. I kiss you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. <laughs> thank you.